born in Cape Canaveral, Florida, this little port city in central Florida on the coast. Have an older sister, younger sister, two parents, strong family. I have a lot of good memories growing up. Underneath all of that was really a struggle with, with social anxiety. So I was silently struggling with that. And waking up became extremely difficult. And yet I remember at the age of 18, graduating high school, like standing before my mom saying, you know, mom, I think, I think uh, I'm depressed. Drugs really became this artificial, superficial form of meaning in my life. Riding down streets, riding on a skateboard in the middle of the night, looking to score, waking up extremely early, going to my drug dealer's door, and one of them pulled out of his pocket this pill, said, oh, it's, you know, this is it's oxycotton. That was the beginning of my, my addiction with with painkillers. A friend comes over, he says it's, it's heroin. I used it and that became my my bread and butter. That became my uh, that became my thing. My mom would wake up in the morning and and go in the room where I was sleeping and just wait to see my breath, wait to see when I would actually breathe, to know that I was, that I was alive. And then my mom one day, she calls me up, how do you feel about maybe going on a trip to Nicaragua with a group of missionaries? At that point in my life, wanted nothing to do with that world. So, so in that sense, like, it's a no-brainer for me. Like, say no. I, uh, I, I said, yeah, I want to do it. Um, I went, I went down there. I went down there a mess. Like, I'm on a plane, a hoodie over my head, didn't want to look anybody in the eye. Um, once I land and once I'm there, I'm thinking, what did I do? Something started changing inside of me. I came to a place where I decided I'm gonna open up to this situation. It was one particular person that I met down there struggling with, with an addiction himself and him and I just connected. Come back from Nicaragua and, and uh, within a short amount of time, I found myself back in my addiction. I spent three days in a hotel room with one other person. We're just binging. I see this this white Jeep Cherokee just circling around my house, circling around around the street I'm on, and I knew exactly who that was. It was it was the uh, the friend that I met in Nicaragua who I connected with. So I told the person that was driving me to stop the car. My buddy sees us he pulls up to the car and says, uh, "Man, you don't you don't have to live this way. You don't have to you don't have to do this. I love you." I went back to the place I was staying at and just was weeping. I ended up packing up my stuff and moving in with my parents. It took about three months to withdraw from my heroin addiction. During that process, I had people surrounding me, friends, my community, my family, just really stepping up and loving me. That was in August 2003. I'm married. I'm going on my first full year of marriage. I'm a full-time student right now while doing some part-time work with Trite Love in Our Arms. I'm studying mental health counseling. Never in the world did I think that I would become a counselor. A large role that I, that I play in Trite Love in Our Arms now is, is being able to, to speak at colleges and universities and to share my story and to, um, to provide hope in people's lives, to really stand up and say, like, I've gone through these things 
and I've come out the other end. And while that's not always how it ends, it's not always a happy ending. In, in many cases, it is, and, and I'm a reflection of that. All of those broken pieces of my past, all of that is connected to this, to this bigger story. It's not this black and white, I was an addict and now I'm, I'm clean. It's, it's, um, every day is, is, I mean, it's a struggle at some level. But I'm able to do it. I'm able to do it because, because of the people around me, because of my community, because of all of the people around me that I love and that love me. I'm able to, uh, I'm able to, to live.